Hi, this is Danny from Mysterious Things Tarot. This is where we take a mystery story or crime and try to bring some insights to it through a tarot reading at the end. So let me tell you a little bit about today's story. Today's story is about the night before Halloween in 1975. This wealthy, gated community of Bellhaven, Connecticut was shaken to its core when the body of a beautiful 15-year-old girl was found under a tree on her family's estate. She had been brutally beaten to death with a golf club. The night before, the teen and a few of her friends had gone out for a night of fun. It was a night before Halloween, and they called it Mischief Night. And they would go out and hang out and do stuff teenagers do. But she didn't come home that night, and her mother started to get worried when her daughter didn't show up. And so about 1 o'clock, she started calling around. And eventually, it, she had to call the police, and they started a desperate search for her and... It ended in tragedy when they found her body under a pine tree in the backyard. The worst part is that she had been bludgeoned to death with a golf club. And she wasn't just hit once, knocked out, and killed. She was repeatedly beaten with this thing so strongly that the golf club would break into four pieces. And then... A pointy end, the piece of th this golf club was jammed into her neck. This case remained unsolved for 27 years until June 2002, when a man was arrested and charged and convicted of the murder with absolutely no evidence. After 11 years in prison, this man's case was vacated. Well, I didn't know what vacated was, and I, I don't know if you do or not, but I decided I'd better look it up. So vacated means that an appellate court has overturned, canceled, or set aside the judgment of a lower court, and the conviction is erased from the record of the criminal history. So that means we're back to square one. This case has never been solved. Although there are a lot of opinions on the identity of the murderer or murderers. The thing is, stories have changed. New evidence is found, old evidence is lost. Law enforcement was at the very best non-professional and at the least incompetent. So I purposefully left out the names associated with this case because I wanted you to look at it without prejudice. Because this case is famous, not for the horrific crime, not for the unlikely location, but for the fact the media made a massive melodrama about this because the boy accused of this crime was the 15 year old cousin. Melodrama about this because the boy accused of this crime was the 15 year old cousin of the Kennedys. Yep, those Kennedys. Can famous names help or hinder a case? The answer to both is yes. But one thing for sure, it can sell newspapers. So in the best interest of media profit, this investigation was slanted in the papers towards 15-year-old Michael Skakel. <laughs> Thank you.
before Halloween, the family's new live-in tutor, Ken Littleton, took the older children, Rush, Thomas, John, Julie, and Michael, to the Bell Haven Club for dinner. He also took their cousin, Jim Terran, and their friend, Andrea Shakespeare, with them. They returned home about 8.45, and Martha and uh, some of the other neighborhood kids came over when they saw them come back, and they sat in the Skakel's Lincoln listening to music. About 9.30, Rush and John came out and told everybody to get out of the car because they were going to drive Jim back to his house. And that was 20 minutes away in North Greenwich. And they were going to stay up there and watch Monty Python's Flying Circus. So Michael decided to go with them. So Michael and John and Rush and Jim, because they were taking Jim home, got in the car and everybody else got out. Helen and Jeff decided to go home. And Tom and Martha were pretty flirty and they had some sort of light sexual encounter that night. Uh, but about a quarter to 10, they kind of rearranged their clothes and Martha said good night. And Tom, the last time he saw her, she was kind of hurrying across um, the backyard trying to get to her house before her curfew at 10. Using autopsy evidence, the police determined that the murder took place at around 10 p.m. That's very close to the time that she left Tom. Michael and his older brothers, who were with Jim watching the movie, didn't get back to Bellhaven until 11.20. He wasn't even in the area when Martha was murdered. Still, there are several suspects in this case. One would be Tom. Tom was the last one to see her. He was 17, and he was considered kind of a prime suspect, but he was never really charged with the murder. He, he had lied to them. He had lied to the therapists and psychologists and consultants, even his family members about his activities with Martha. But mostly, I believe it was about the sexual encounter that they had and he was embarrassed or he didn't want to tell them about it. And that kind of led to everything else that, that was going on with Tom. There's also Ken Littleton. Remember him? He was the family's new tutor. In fact, it was his first night there at the residence. Their father was away on a hunting trip and Ken Littleton and there was a housekeeper nanny there also. So Ken Littleton, the kid's new live-in tutor was there and it was his first night and he said that he and Thomas were watching TV. But Littleton lied. He lied at five lie detector tests he changed his story at least five times. He was the first person that law enforcement focused on. He was a big guy and he was known to have a, a violent temper. And then there's Michael, who was, according to witnesses, eight miles away watching the U.S. premiere of Monty Python's Flying Circus with his friends and family. Over the years, there have been other suspects. Tony Bryant, former classmate of Michael at the Brunswick School in Greenwich, um, said that he and two of his friends, Adolph Hasbrook and Burton Tinsley, had been in Greenwich the night of Martha's killing, and that the other two were really drunk, and they confessed to him that they had killed Martha.
you're here today because you have information in regards to the Martha Moxley murder case that goes back to the 1970s. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, let me ask you, why have you come forward? And I don't mean just today, I'm talking about fairly recently. I really didn't come forward under my own, um, my own efforts. I came forward uh, based on conversations that I've had with uh, interested parties in this, in this investigation. Okay. Uh, if I can, you could verify it. You had said that you're not a big fan of Michael Skate. I'm not a fan of anybody, but Michael and I never had a, a, an enduring, any type of enduring moments at, ever, at all. We've always been sort of adversaries. Okay. But I find that an important statement, and the reason I'm saying that is you, you said to me, uh, even though you were never friends and you're not a big fan of his, I have to do what's right, I think were your words to me. Sure, I just wanted to know, I want everyone to know my story, but at that you know, when people ask me about Michael, I don't really, I mean, I feel badly for him, but, you know, just because I don't like him doesn't mean he should be incarcerated. Right. right. That's right. Okay. The one Tony also said, in case anybody was thinking about, well, the golf club, where did that come from? Well, that came from the Skakel's house. But the thing about that is there was always a golf club laying around there. They, the, the father had them all over because he used them when he went for a walk in the neighborhood because there were a lot of dogs running around. He used them to knock them away from him. And so there were golf clubs all over. People said they would just pick them up and play with them, putts around with them, throw them down. So they, they were there. Anybody could have picked up these golf clubs so that they weren't as big a clue as you would imagine. Um, they there were all these kind of fringy people um, that were there that night. Why did they focus on Michael? Well, at first they didn't. And they really couldn't figure out who did it. And so the case kind of went cold. But in the early 90s, the Connecticut authorities relaunched this investigation and public interest was also really high because at that time, let's sell some more books, Dominic Dunn wrote a book called A Season in Purgatory. And it was a fictionalized account of the crime. And he was on all the talk shows and he was being interviewed about this book and he was sure that Michael did it. <clears throat> also, around the same time, Los Angeles police detective Mark Furman wrote a book, A Murder in Greenwich, in which he claimed that Michael Skakel killed Moxley in a jealous rage because she was romantically interested in his older brother, Mark, older brother, Tom. Mark Furman, yes, the police detective who lied under oath about his use of the N-word during the O.J. Simpson murder trial in 1995. Now, there's a reliable source. But hey, let's sell some more books. So as I said before, there's a lot of old evidence, missing evidence, straight out lies about this case. DNA was co collected, or at least there were items collected, it wasn't very precise back then as it is now. And, and it, if some of the items were retested, possibly there would be a different conclusion. But there were two hairs that were recovered near Moxley's body and they were reportedly identified as an African-American and somewhat a mixed race, which fits the racial profiles of Hasbro and Tinsley. But one of the samples was degraded and the other was lost. Now there was a 1976 request for a warrant to arrest Tom. This document detailed the evidence against Michael's older brother, who was an early suspect in the case. But that document's gone missing. That document indicated how confident police were at the time that the older brother, not Michael, had murdered 15-year-old Moxley, but we'll never know. 
The missing golf club head, that was never found. The missing golf club handle, which was found and possibly had DNA evidence on it, has been misplaced. And the witnesses. All in all, there were 51 witnesses, but at least 17 of them now are deceased. So there was a lot of information about this case and a lot of misinformation around this case. And it was really highlighted because of the connection to the Kennedys. And did this 15-year-old kid get railroaded? He didn't. It was 27 years after the murder when they arrested Michael for the murder. 27 years. So there's a lot of information about this and most recently in a book that Michael and his cousin Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wrote and they wrote it and the name is framed and I've linked to a free audio book of it below. Um, as I said in the beginning, Michael's conviction was vacated at this point in time, Michael's a free man. The state of Connecticut has refused to retry him because they said they can't prove it was Michael beyond a reasonable doubt, leaving this case still unsolved. This must be heartbreaking for Martha's family to still not know what really happened that night in 1975. So, Let's look for a little insight into what happened to Martha. Let's ask the cards. Today I'm going to be using Barbara Moore's Steampunk Tarot Cards. So I've did a little shuffling off camera. So you have to listen to too much of it going on in your ears. I know that it really bothers some people. What I'm trying to find out here is what happened to Martha Moxley. How I do my cards is I do three cards before the event, three cards of the event, and three cards in the aftermath of the event. at that one flipped over already for me let's take that right there like that next one these are three cards before the event three cards about what happened at the event and three cards on the aftermath of the event the first card that we have here is the Seven of Swords reversed. The Seven of Swords indicates that there were some lies happening. Someone was overconfident, um, but they had weaknesses and faults. You know, could Martha have been testing her femininity? kind of a push me, push away, come here, go away, saying yes, saying no, leaving somebody frustrated, um, somebody not knowing where they stood. That's a possibility. This, remember, this is before the event. Um, this is, the next card is the Six of Pentacles. The Six of Pentacles indicates a kind person who's willing to share their abundance with others. Um, that definitely could be Martha. 
And the last is the Page of Swords. And that is, um, again, it has to do kind of with the first one, in that the Page of Swords is kind of a promise that's reversed, or a relationship that is kind of filled with deceit and lies and and uh, not knowing where they stood and that kind of thing. So there was um, some turmoil going on around her. She was a nice person. Um, I don't think she intentionally was trying to cause anybody harm, but girls of that age are... Um, don't exactly know, um, but girls of that age do tend to, to check out their own sexuality in and how that affects the boys in their lives. So it very well could be what was going on there. The event itself, or her death, um, the first one is the Eight of Cups. Now someone has turned, you can see here, someone has turned their back on the abundance around them. They felt insecure, they felt uncertain. They had all of these, all of these gifts and, and anything they could want for. They weren't, that wasn't their focus. Their focus was um, kind of a, within themselves, a, an insecure person. The next is the star. The star is about, you know, that's normally about meditation or something <clears throat> that has to do with a meditative state. So I'm thinking this murderer might have been in um, blind, or like a <clears throat> meditative killing, uh, a blackout state, something like that, something where they weren't, they were so... Um, into this this killing they didn't even know what they were doing the last card in the event is the two of swords reversed and that leads me to think that there were two people involved two people involved they were partners in crime that came together for that moment um, and then separated they weren't they weren't uh friends or family or uh, they just were there for that. They were there for for the killing, uh, helping each other, but the, they were not, um, they were not close friends. In the aftermath of the event is the moon. The moon always is about secrets and lies and deceit, hidden forces at work. You can see here there are, you can see this hidden guy under here. There are two towers. Those are high emotions, um, lack of information. They're separated. Again, I think these two people from here live far apart and are not close friends. They may not have lived far apart then, but they do now. This is the aftermath. And the next card is the chariot reversed. Now the chariot represents the inability to fend off the opposition. They were kind of undecided about what to do about what happened, and they weren't really rational, so they decided not to do anything and not to say anything and just keep their heads down. And it seems to have worked for them. The last card here is the King of Pentacles. And there is an older man involved who offered to help them. Um, but this man uh, was not sincere. So he, he didn't offer to help them with with the murder. He offered to help them with the aftermath. But it's a they didn't they did not take this offer and it's a good thing they didn't because he he could have caused them 
more trouble or cause them to get caught or something like that. This relay doesn't tell me as much as I'd like it to. Um, so I'm going to, I think I'll take the next, I don't even need to pick that up. I'll take the next three cards here. The Hanged Man. The Four of Pentacles. And the Four of Wands. Okay, uh, the hangman. I think that indicates that you need to look at this from like a new perspective for it to bear any fruit. Somebody has information, but they're not going to give it up without getting something in return. You have to find the person with the information, and then you have to find out what they want before they're going to give it to you. Very tricky situation to do that. This uh, this says this situation's not leading anywhere. This is the five, I mean four of Pentacles reversed. It says this is going nowhere. And this is the four of Wands, which would be a future happiness and growth, but it is reversed. So there may be some um, solution in the future, but it would be very far in the future. And these are the things that are blocking it. The different perspective, they, you, they have to take their focus off what they're focusing on and focus on something else and someone has the information. Focus on someone who might have information that can tell them more, or this is, is going nowhere. And it's gonna take a while. It, you know, all the parties may be gone by the time this gets solved. Anyway, that's my reading uh, on the Martha Moxley murder. I hope you found it interesting and informative and please like and share and leave comments, if you will, down below. I appreciate everything, and thank you for subscribing. I will see you next time. Have a great week. Bye-bye.